Good afternoon. If everybody could please uh, take a seat uh, and quiet their conversations. Mr. City Attorney. Thank you. Uh, and um, uh, one more disruption, Mr. Nagel. <laughs> and you're out. Um, welcome to the Transportation Committee meeting of Wednesday, February 12th. Uh, I'm Mike Bonin along with Paul Koretz. And we're going to get right into it. Uh, we have uh, a couple people who have filled out multiple comment cards. Uh, is Ms. Ramirez here? Okay. Uh, Mr. Chandler? Come on up. Oh, actually, you're, you're good. Uh, we'll call you up for, we'll do item, items three and six we'll do separately, so. Um, okay, last call for uh, general public comment. Okay, general public comment is closed. Uh, Mr. Kretz, I'm going to recommend we move items two, four, five, and nine uh, on consent with a technical correction on item 9E. Yes, we want to uh, change the hours from the 7 a.m. to 12 a.m. to all hours of the day, so I recommend to approve as amended. Okay. Any objections? No. Okay, items two, four, five, and nine as amended are approved. Uh, and that uh, brings us to Item number one. Item number one is a Rue Bonin resolution relative to designating stalls with electrical vehicle charging stations for the exclusive use of charging and parking a vehicle that is connected for electric charging and related actions. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Gallagher. I'm with the Department of Transportation. For this item, about a year ago, the City Council adopted an ordinance that established Los Angeles Municipal Code Section 88.66A, which uh, stated that the City Council can designate spaces for the exclusive use of electric vehicle charging stations. At that time, the Bureau of Street Lighting and Department of Water and Power started to install electric vehicle charging uh, equipment on streetlight poles and utility poles, but the Department of Transportation was not able to enforce the parking of electric vehicles that were charging because we needed a resolution to do so. The first batch that was installed prior to the ordinance, uh, it was 63 locations, all the signs are up, and those locations are being uh, enforced today, but we now have 70 more locations that we need a resolution for in order to be able to post the signs and enforce them. Uh, these are all locations that are in non-metered zones. There will be a separate resolution coming to take care of the metered locations in the future. Uh, when do you anticipate that'll be coming? Uh, maybe in a month or so. Okay, sooner the better. Uh, Mr. Kretz? Nothing to add. Okay, um, uh, so that uh, is the receive and file item? All right, so we'll receive. Approve. Okay, we will approve this item, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to item number three. Item number three is a Coretz Wesson Bonin Rue Coretz Wesson Martin Mar motions uh, instructing CLA with the assistance of the mayor's office, CAO, departments of planning and economic and workforce development, LADOT, as well as Metro, City of West Hollywood, and the County of Los Angeles to accelerate the Crenshaw North Extension Rail Line project. Okay, we have two uh, public comment cards. We'll start with uh, Mr. Chandler and uh, David Fenn. Go ahead, sir. Uh, my name is Patrick Chandler uh, with, uh, with Metro. Uh, I'm here to show Metro support for item three that seeks to help accelerate Metro's Crenshaw Northern Extension project in the heart of Los Angeles. Currently, the Crenshaw Northern Extension project advanced, the project's advanced alternative screening study, or early study, is now in its final stages. Project staff expect to present recommendations to the Metro Board of Directors on which alternatives should continue into the environmental study in April. Metro looks forward to the strength and partnership between the city and county that this motion seeks to provide. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is David Fan. I'm a planner with the city of West Hollywood. And on behalf of the city, I'd like to thank the, the council members for uh, introducing this motion and considering it, establishing a framework for interagency coordination and the acceleration of the northern extension of the Crenshaw Line. Uh, with connections to four existing metro rail lines and the introduction of a new north-south transit spine, reducing the need to transfer downtown, Crenshaw North will be the busiest light rail line in the county. 
as Metro prepares to move ahead with an EIR for the project and we continue our funding and project delivery study, it's more important than ever for Metro, Los Angeles, West Hollywood, and the county to work together on this. Yes, We're working with Supervisor Kuehl's office to identify the appropriate county representative and look forward to work, working more closely with LA on this in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kretz, uh, you're one of the makers of the motion. Would you like to kick us off? Yeah, I'd just say that originally uh, uh, this is a line that was expected to be completed in 2047, but we have a chance to uh, accelerate this significantly. It will be particularly helpful to uh, constituents in uh, the districts that are the makers of the motion, Council Member Rue, Council Member Wesson's districts, and my own, as well as the City of West Hollywood. But I think it's also uh, significant for the entire region because it'll help interconnect the red line, green line, purple line, um, and it's expected to have uh, as many as 90,000 riders a day, which would be one of the busier routes. So for that reason, uh, if we're able to accelerate this, I think it will be significantly helpful to the region and also in terms of uh, making rail transit a, a true alternative to the motor vehicle, you really need to be able to get everywhere, and this is uh, one of the significant gaps that will be closed. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I agree. It's a great project. Um, I appreciate your leadership, uh, Mr. Ruse's Thank leadership, uh, folks from West Hollywood and the coalition behind this. Um, uh, this is a worthwhile project, uh, but there's a lot of questions that need to be answered about uh, what, uh, how it could be done, uh, and how it could be financed, and these motion or the motion today will uh, help us begin to open those lines of communication and have those discussions. Uh, I think it's a, a, a great project, um, uh, and I know you have great affection for the city of West Hollywood. Just a little bit. Uh, I have an equal affection for Los Angeles International Airport, and my thing I want to make sure during this entire process is there is nothing about accelerating this that does anything to uh, derail the line from the San Fernando Valley through the Sepulveda Pass uh, to LAX and eventually to the South Bay. Um, so, but given the way that Metro has, has dealt with the issue of, of accelerating projects, that shouldn't be an issue, just that'll be what I'll be mindful for going forward. Uh, so. Um, there's two different motions on this one, substantially similar. The uh, recommendation is to receive and file uh, the, the, the first one, the Caretz Wesson, and approve the second one, the, the Rue Caretz Wesson one, with all three of your names on it. Okay, right. so without objection, that is the direction of the committee. Very good. That brings us to item number six. Item number six is a DOT report relative to maximizing traffic signal priority for the Exposition E-Line where it operates in street running mode. Thank you, sir. Yeah, come on up. Good afternoon. Dan Mitchell with LA Department of Transportation, Assistant General Manager. Uh, I'd first like to thank Councilmember Bonin for the opportunity to take another look at the way that the Exposition E-Line runs uh, through the street running section. That's the, the area where the trains follow the traffic signals. Um, and in maybe a little background first so that we can kind of um, speak from there. So the, the traffic signals in that area run in a repeated pattern, a progressive pattern that helps to kind of pave a path of green lights, if you will, for the trains going in both directions along exposition. That recurring pattern uh, happens every two minutes or 120 seconds. And um, engineers laid out in cooperation with Metro when the line first opened uh, this, this, uh, this path in time through this, uh, through this area to make sure that trains could move as efficiently as possible. Um, to be clear, LADOT prioritizes transit uh, in all of the on all of the lines where the trains follow traffic signals. Uh, in addition to providing that kind of progressive path, um, which builds in a time for the trains to stop at stations and then continue on, um, we've also instituted transit priority. And that transit priority 
allows the traffic signals to adjust the window of time that the trains can pass through the traffic signal without stopping. It's very similar to holding the elevator for someone if you see that they're, they're really close. It can actually bring the green light up early or extend it later. Um, but the, the traffic signals, particularly along exposition, are quite large. Uh, the intersections are quite large. The streets are quite large. And the amount of time within that cycle, within the 120 seconds, that we can adjust is very small. So that is the background. Uh, so we appreciate the opportunity to look at this uh, situation. And what we found were two things. Number one is that over the years, uh, as this line has become more successful, uh, it takes more time to board and alight passengers at each of the stations. And so the trains were spending a little bit longer than we had accounted for. And then they weren't able to keep up with the pattern of green lights that were waiting for them ahead. And that resulted in them having to wait at a signal and wait for a complete cycle of indications, which could be quite long. Uh, the other thing that we found is that we could do, we could do quite better in opening that window and holding the elevator door, for example. So to solve the first problem, we studied and evaluated, uh, we focused on the area between Vermont and Western as, as a starting place, because we found a lot of the trains were delayed in that segment. Only about half the trains made it through Normandy, which is at the midpoint. And uh, in analyzing this, we found, we, uh, found that they were staying longer at stations, and we built that into the progression and changed the sequence of lights so that the trains could keep up with that path of green lights. And in doing that, uh, we greatly increased the percentage of trains that could get through without stopping. But we wanted to do more because we wanted to be able to open that window larger than we could right now. And in order to do that, uh, in challenging ourselves, we looked at some existing features we had in the program and applied them in a new way. And that new way is really borrowing ahead. So it's kind of like opening a line of credit or charging something on their credit card when you don't have enough, in this case, time in the cycle to wait for the train that's coming. So by using this new feature, we're actually able to borrow time from future cycles. So in the second two minutes and third two minutes to wait for an approaching train if its, if it's arrival is impending. So, uh, and then pay that back over time. To my knowledge, this approach has never been taken uh, in trying to help transit and, and traffic signals. And what we found in the short term in, in working on just applying this in Normandy is we were able to increase the number of, or the percentage of trains that could get through the signal without delay um, from 50% up to 80%. And of the trains that did have to stop, they had a very short delay um, rather than waiting for a whole cycle of indications. So we're hopeful that when applying that same strategy to the broader signal system, it will take some effort, but that it's going to uh, produce some, some very real and um, uh, tangible results that will help improve travel times as well as the reliability of trains, because that's important as well. By, by maintaining a coordinated pattern of all of these signals, the signals can anticipate when trains are going to arrive so that they can travel through the corridor in both directions. And with that, I'm open to uh, any, any questions. We, we recommend the Council's uh, approval of this approach and the direction to expand it through the corridor. Um, Patrick Chandler has another uh, public comment. Do you want to come on up? Thank you. Patrick Chandler, Earth Metro. I'm here to show Metro's support for this motion as it will help increase the speed and efficiency of the Expo Line, or E-Line, that carries over 50,000 passengers during the work week. Our CEO, Phil Washington, has made it one of his top priorities to find ways to improve customer services, efficiencies, and speed up the E-Line and the entire rail and bus network. If E-Line trains are sitting at intersections, the time savings and benefits for transit riders is diminished. Metro critically depends on the city to help fulfill it, the desires. If not, mandates from the public transit riders seeking or seek, or, well, they're seeking faster service. Metro can only do so much on its own. Metro looks forward to the continued partnership with the city of Los Angeles to address congestion on city streets, freeways, and highways to keep Angelinos moving. Thank you. 
Thanks. Um, let me ask you a couple questions. First of all, thank you for the work on this. I'm, I'm uh, uh, really impressed with the, the, the different approach you, you took on this. Uh, I like to see that DOT is, is, is doing things differently and thinking outside the box, so thank you for that. Um, uh, of course, I just want the trains to start moving a lot faster, like today. So there's, there's, there's part of me that's disappointed. Um, and I think that that sentiment would be shared by a lot of riders. Um, why can't we just do signal preemption the whole way? I'd be happy to address that. So um, maybe just for everyone's understanding. So what, what we've been doing is priority, which retains the sequence of lights, right? So we've all experienced left turns and, and uh, straight ahead movements. So it maintains that same order, but then kind of stretches the window as I described. Preemption actually is an emergency situation that interrupts whatever the traffic signal is doing to address that emergency. Uh, in this case, if it was preemption for trains, um, that, that is an operation that, that um, currently exists kind of in the midsection of uh, the expo line where the train runs on its own right of way. So there, rather than running in the street, uh, it operates in its own right of way. There are no traffic signals for it to follow. Instead, as it arrives at intersections, they prepare and they go through. So this, the same operation could happen at full traffic signals. And in fact, there are, some, there are some areas, like on Long Beach Avenue, where the trains do operate in that manner. They were designed for that operation from the get-go, uh, and they're equipped with gates, bells, and to deal with the train's arrival as kind of an emergency. They're going very fast, and they won't stop. So is that a good approach for this corridor? Well, we don't know, um, but, but we could anticipate that if we treat the train's arrival as an unexpected surprise, that it creates um, maybe more disruption than for people who are walking across these large streets or, or waiting to make a turn to get across, including transit. I'll point out on Vermont and on Western, there's a lot of transit. Um, that treating it by this, like this surprise that everyone has to clear out, it's kind of like a traffic officer stepping into the intersection and stopping everybody. Um, that we lose the opportunity to have a predictable progressive movement through the system and maintain headways and travel time reliability. Because while preemption is great for the first train, when there's a train coming the other direction, the traffic signal has to get through and get ready again and doesn't and may not provide the most, um, the best operation. Sure. Um, I hear that. Um, I want to be mindful of the mayor's executive directive the other day. Uh, I believe you were there. I wasn't able to make it. Um, where uh, one of the things he talked about was uh, improving sustainable transit and, and talking about uh, doing more signal preemption and more signal priority. So I, I, I like the approach you're taking. I have a couple questions on it, but, mm -hmm. but what I wanted to, to, to suggest is that in addition to the, the next step that you're recommending, which I support, is a, a report back on the, the, the question of, of, of full signal preemption, an analysis of, of what the impacts and trade-offs would be. be. Be very clear with us about what the impacts would be on pedestrians and on other forms of transit. Uh, I think that's, that, that's important. Um, you know, we shouldn't be uh, 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 pitting someone riding a, a bus north against someone taking the, the, the train east. Um, uh, but um, uh, also, detail for us if there are infrastructure differences that would be required to do it, this is something Metro is very eager for us to do. Define what that is, and then maybe we say to Metro, you want this faster, here's one of the things that, that can be done to get it. Um, so uh, I'll make that part of the recommendation at the end, but the, um, the, the, the question, the, the dynamic you're talking about is sort of borrowing from from later, that doesn't create, just, it doesn't have a, a domino effect of a delay later? So it, it does, but it's a, it's a managed delay. So if, so what happens is it kind of gets, gets out of sync and then works its way back over, one, over multiple cycles. In the past um, 
or traditionally, I'll say the, the operation is constrained to the current 120 seconds cycle. Um, but we never anticipated looking ahead to borrow from the future and then try and work your way back. So while it does create a little bit of delay, so let's say, for example, instead of six seconds, it waited 12 seconds or 18 seconds for the train to come through. That went three cycles ahead. Then the, the, um, the green light for trains coming in both directions would be, would be delayed a little bit longer. And then over several cycles would work its way back. So one cycle would be at 12 seconds later. And the effect could be, yes, if a train is coming the other direction, it may be delayed a few seconds. We don't know. It depends on exactly when it arrives. But we anticipate that it will allow the train to catch back up into the pattern of green that we've set in front of it and allow it to move forward without stopping. OK, so those are a lot of words. Grant. <laughs> It's, right. I'm having flashbacks. Will it create the, delays? The, the, okay. the sort of essay math questions. Oh, on sorry. The, okay. On the SAT. I'll try again. Delay. And so there are other movements, right? The, the, the transit going north and south and other people traveling across, across that. Will it create more delays for them? No, because the, the, the minimum times for everyone to get through the intersection will be maintained. We're just going to be stretching to borrow kind of like on your credit card take out a line of credit and pay it back over time. So it won't be, it won't be more disruptive than um, we would otherwise uh, experience now. It just would allow us to get those benefits at once in a burst when we need them. So let's assume, hypothetically, that I understood what you were saying. <laughs> um, it was clear in my mind. Might be a big assumption. <laughs> um, it, it still works out if you do that with multiple Yes. Intersections and signals? Yes, because the same approach could be taken at each intersection. Right now we've implemented it at one, um, which is allowed, maybe, maybe a train had to stay a little bit longer at a station and was about to miss the green light. It could say, hey, it's coming. We'll wait longer than we normally would, even though, even though we may not be able to afford it right now, but we know that over the next three cycles we can pay it back. In the same way, if you, if you wanted to buy a big dinner and you didn't have it in your dining budget, you put it on the credit card and over a few months you pay it back. Fortunately, ATSAC is smarter than I am. <laughs> uh, Mr. Kretz. Yeah, I, I mean, in theory, this sounds like a good idea. In practice in my district, I think we found that giving Expo priority actually causes a lot of disruption of north-south traffic. And we've gotten fewer complaints. I, I'm not sure if that's because it's less of a problem or more likely people have just accepted that that's a lengthy wait and that's, that's part of the new, uh, new, new system. So um, it doesn't mean that it's better. And I've personally seen one of the worst, not even during rush hour. I've, I've driven up Overland, stopped at the expo, seen a train go by, Okay, nothing happens, see another train go by, then another train comes in that direction, a couple more this way, one more this way, one more this way, and you've waited over 10 minutes, and you have massive lines in both directions. Um, and this sounds like it could even exacerbate that. So I would just ask, as you plan this system, that you also try to take that problem into account and, and somehow uh, try to address that at the same time. Uh, we'll, we will consider that in how we respond back about um, both the costs and benefits of preemption. Obviously, those seven trains you saw obviously got to get through Overland without waiting, and that they were presumably full of a lot of people. But with the cumulative effects of trains running very close together can be very disruptive. So the intent of providing a progressive system that, that operates on a two-minute cycle would allow Metro to help maintain their, their headways, and provide overall system efficiency. And I don't know if we've, I know this is sort of an ongoing issue and debate, I don't know if we've maximized the number of cars that we can attach to each train, and whether that might allow us to run uh, a couple fewer trains and uh, you know, break that up a little bit as well. I couldn't say, but I agree with you. If we could look at all those issues, that would be great. Okay.
Thank you. And last question is, um, there are two stretches here to consider. There's the exposition part, uh, and then there's the flower part. Uh, I think, as a, as, a, as a writer, and I think most writers would agree with me, sort of the bulk of the, the frustrating delay tends to be on the flower portion. Uh, Expo is easier for you to analyze because it's pretty much just you, right? But when you get into flower, you need a better coordination with Metro because there's other lines and stuff, right? Yeah, so on flower, once we get to the section between Washington and 11th, mm -hmm. we have two lines running, both the A line and the E line. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's more demand, but there's also a coordinated pattern that Metro needs to operate with their trains to manage the 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 end of the line, if you will, at 7th and Metro. Uh, so until the regional connector opens, there is a careful dance that, that Metro is coordinating in addition to the work that we're doing with the traffic signal. So it does make it more complicated. Uh, but um, So that's why we started on exposition and testing this, and then we will look to expand it uh, to the other areas as well. Okay, and I'm sure Metro is more than eager to cooperate with you on the flower part. Yes, we've been working very closely with them and shared this news, and we will continue to... Uh, to coordinate with them to help uh, improve travel time, um, both the end-to-end -end travel time and the reliability, with that goal of 90%. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so it sounds like without objection, it's approved. Go forth quickly. Yes. <laughs> okay, item uh, seven. Item number seven is the DOT report relative to extending for one year the LA Now Pilot Micro On Demand Transit Service Program in the communities of Mar, Mar Vista, Venice, Delray, and Palms. Good afternoon. My name is Corinne Raff, and I'm with the Department of Transportation. And I'm here to report back on the evaluation of the first year of the LA Micro Transit Pilot Project. Um, the report covers um, the period from March 11, 2019, when it started, um, through January 31, 2020. Um, the LA Now Microtransit serves the communities of Mar Vista, Venice, Playa del Rey, and Palms in the west side of LA. And um, key locations within those communities include the Expo Lines, both at Palms as well as on the Culver City. Um, it also serves the Google Venice campus and certain high schools within that community. Um, service operates Monday through Friday from 6 a.m. until 7 p.m. with peak service from 6 to 9 and um, again from 4, uh, 4 to 7. Off peak is between um, 9 and 4. Um, like any other pilot project, this, the service began rather slowly, ridership began slowly. But ridership has continued to increase, and the momentum is as such that at the beginning of February, we are seeing the highest numbers of riders since the program started. Um, passengers are evenly divided between peak and off-peak. We have about 55% of the riders using the service during peak and about roughly 45% during off-peak. Um, passengers can book a ride using the LA Now app, and the majority of them do, 95% of them do. Um, they can also book a ride online, or they can um, call the uh, call center if they don't have access to uh, a smartphone. Um, almost 53% of the riders reported that they would have driven alone or used Uber and Lyft for their trip. And, um, and since the inception, about 158 p um, persons have, with disabilities have used the service. And the program, like any other pilot, has experienced some challenges in the beginning and during the first year, and chief among them was the app. Um, riders reported that the app was um, not user-friendly, it was not intuitive, and it was clunky. And one of the things that we have recommended was for a new app to be um, put into place, VIA. And we, the, the VIA app is expected to address not only the concerns from the user end, but also from the back end where we are hoping to have the app assist us with great, greater back-end efficiencies, um, including uh, adjusting the operating hours with the service area as needed. Um, combined with targeted and strategic outreach and advertising, the communities, um, the department anticipates that the ridership will continue to grow. So while some key um, KPIs were not met during this first year, we anticipate that the combination of the 
new app as well as some targeted marketing and outreach, that the, the service will continue to mature. And, that, and because of that, we are recommending that the department, that the, uh, the pilot be continued for an additional year um, through April the 30th, 2021, and that the department report back by March the 10th of 2021 with an evaluation of the second year um, and includes um, the decision of whether to make the service a permanent one. Uh, thank you for the report. Thank you for the service. Uh, I'm glad that it's growing in popularity. I mean, it's, it's absolutely uh, an essential service, uh, and I hope it continues to grow. Uh, you know, we, we kicked it off at uh, uh, Marvista Gardens, Mr. Caress and I, uh, a little over a year ago, where uh, my predecessor, Mr. Rosendahl, had been trying to get dash service you know, 15 years ago. And uh, it, it's absolutely needed by, the, by people there who are transit dependent. Uh, and uh, I've been impressed to see the different populations that have been using it. I know uh, Principal of Venice High loves it, is, is a huge uh, sort of evangelist for it. Uh, some of the tech workers have been using it. Uh, but there is a tremendous room for growth. There is a tremendous room for growth. And I agree that uh, the app has been a problem, so I'm glad that the app, uh, a new app is going to be, be rolling out. Uh, the marketing has been horrible, though. I mean, it's just, I mean, government doesn't do a good job marketing anything, uh, I including, in including the electeds. We just, we're not all that good at it. And uh, I think this has suffered from, from, lack of, of, of sufficient marketing. Um, you know, I, I meet with groups of people all the time, and the number of people who have heard of LA Now is just, it, 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 it's negligible. And most people who, who have used it say good things, but the word just isn't getting out. We've gotten Rec and Parks to agree to start uh, promoting it to its, its users and its service areas, but uh, one of the things I want to know more about, and I'll ask for it to sort of report back, is, is more on what the marketing strategy going forward is going to be. Uh, uh, the other thing I, the other concern I have is, it, it's been an issue of mine from the beginning, is I think based on the, there being a significant population of, of people uh, who are transit dependent, I think starting with these hours was the right move. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't support reducing any of those hours. But I think we would see a tremendous spike in ridership if we were to include uh, some evenings or weekends. Uh, people, I think, would love to go from various neighborhoods in Mar Vista or Palms or Venice to uh, to, to any of the, the, the different restaurants on, uh, on in, in Palms on Venice Boulevard, um, uh, on a great street in Mar Vista, uh, all over the place. And I think it would be a, a great way to, th that would be a marketing phenomenon in and of itself, just based on that. And on the weekends, particularly in the summer, it's, it's a way for people from a number of communities on the west side to get to the beach. Uh, so I'd, I'd also want a report back on uh, the potential uh, for uh, evening and, and weekend service, perhaps at least over the summer, uh, to see how that goes. Uh, not to, to hold anything up, but just as an additional sort of action. Mr. Kretz? Yeah, I would tend to agree with uh, everything you said just from the start, that we were both there at the launch, and I think it's had especially significant benefits in CD11. What I don't know for sure is whether the marketing has caught up with the Palms area and other areas east of the 405. So I'd, I'd like to hear a report back on that and how we could, uh, as you said, expand more creative marketing efforts and outreach efforts um, so that uh, we can make much more use of, of uh, what I think is a great system and also uh, Maybe we can uh, partner with USC because I know we have a number of students in the Palms area that can sort of use this as a, a first mile, last mile connection to the Expo line. And uh, maybe we can explore that uh, a little bit more actively as well. And my staff is happy to coordinate with uh, this effort in any way possible. 
Thank you. I, I think that there were so much overriding concerns about the app that we wanted to make sure that that was fixed before we kind of pushed yeah. any oh, further marketing outreach out. Yeah. But hopefully now that the kinks are worked out, now we can focus a little more on marketing. Yeah. Uh, also, the addition early on of, 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 of more stops, I think, was very, very helpful. Uh, it, it has better service because of that. Yeah. It's easier for people to, to figure out. One of the things that hobbled it at the beginning, too, is that the, the, the operators weren't familiar with the neighborhood. Yes. So they had a hard time figuring out where to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that worked itself out over time. Um, okay, so um, we will uh, approve this and direct LADOT to report back, uh, say, in 30 days with a cost estimate and potential funding sources for the addition of evening and weekend service and um, uh, to um, also report back on how the marketing strategy is going to work uh, both in CD11 and in CD5. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Did I get those directions right? OK. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. OK, that brings us to item number eight. Item number eight is the DOT report relative to the status of the Vision Zero program, implementation strategy, and 2019 program accomplishments. Hello. Good afternoon, council members. Um, um, I'm Nader Asmar from the Department of Transportation, Principal Transportation Engineer over Vision Zero programs. And I have with me today Lauren Ballard, Supervising Transportation Planner, uh, who's part of the Vision Zero team as well. Today we are here to give an annual update on the Vision Zero program. Pursuant to Council Motion 17-1137, this is really an opportunity for us to give you a recap of what we've done in 2019 for Vision Zero and a look ahead to 2020 and what we plan to do. Uh, the guiding principle of Vision Zero is to create a system where street design can take into account human error and mistakes are not fatal. We are utilizing every tool at our disposal, trying new things and are hyper-focused on delivery of projects. A year ago, we came to the committee with a new set of priority corridors and intersections. And since then, we've been delivering on safety improvements on the uh, following our data-driven plan. Last year, we installed over 1,500 individual safety improvements on priority corridors. We saw a combination of some quick, uh, low-cost implementations and many longer-term, more capital-intensive projects that we had laid the groundwork for in previous years. Uh, this was more than double what we had installed in 2018. We began implementing on the ground safety improvements in early 2017 for Vision Zero. And since then, we've seen a 7% reduction in fatalities across the city. In 2020 and beyond, we anticipate installing more transformative projects, especially along corridors, where we have engaged with the community and built um, community support for. This year, we will also complete a new safety study, refreshing what we did in 2016 where we're going to look at the root causes of the collisions and evaluate locations and projects where we've made improvements to see their efficacy. Um, I do want to thank the mayor and the council for their leadership in this effort um, and also take the opportunity to acknowledge the dedicated Vision Zero team at LADOT and the tireless work of our amazing field crews who are out there in the middle of the night putting these things in. At this point, I'll hand it over to Lauren to go into a little bit more detail on some of our key programs and initiatives. Thanks. Again, I'm Lauren Ballard with the Department of Transportation. As Nader stated, Vision Zero implemented more safety treatments in 2019 than in any previous year. And not only did we implement more treatments, but for the first year ever, we implemented a series of capital projects. Thanks in part to dedicated Vision Zero signal funds, in 2019, LADOT installed more than 100 traffic signal safety improvements. 39 new left turn up signal upgrades will keep people walking in a crosswalk safer by separating their walk time from the time people are attempting to make a left turn. 16 new traffic signals will reduce conflicts and confusion at intersections for all road users and provide people walking with dedicated crossing opportunities. 43 additional intersections with leading pedestrian intervals will give people walking a head start as they cross the street, making them more visible to people making right turns. 13 new pedestrian flashing beacons will alert drivers to the presence of people walking in a crosswalk. And the city's first two pedestrian hawk signals will give drivers a red light 
to ensure people crossing have the right of way. Much of the signal work occurred on our Vision Zero priority corridors as part of larger comprehensive safety projects. In 2019, we implemented five capital intensive safety projects on priority corridors. We installed two way cycle tracks on Main and Spring Street in downtown Los Angeles and installed the first three complete streets projects on Temple, Roscoe, and Venice. We also installed immediate phase one treatments on all 20 newly identified city priority, city owned priority corridors. First, we upgraded over 1,000 crosswalks to high visibility continental style to ensure visibility of pedestrians and installed 80 speed feedback signs at the entrances to those priority corridors to help people driving be aware of their speed. We installed a full phase one project on 13 corridors and we'll wrap the next seven early this year. Thanks to the planning and engagement done in 2018 and in 2019, this year LEDOT will install lane reconfigurations with protected bicycle facilities on Avalon Boulevard and Broadway in South Los Angeles. To lay the groundwork for future such projects, in 2019 we initiated a study of the feasibility of lane reconfigurations on other priority corridors. Transformative projects are contingent upon successful community engagement. Our strategy has evolved to include close collaboration with community-based organizations and residents, capacity building, street team deployment, and hyper-local community events. When deployed, the strategy has been successful. Key to the successes of Vision Zero is a, fo is a focus on protecting some of our most vulnerable road users, children and seniors. Traffic deaths are the leading cause of death for children ages 4 to 15 in Los Angeles County. In 2019, LADOT's Safe Routes to School program installed significant safety improvements at 12 of the top 50 schools of most need. We secured $33 million in additional ATP funding for our safety improvements around the next eight schools. Our Vision Zero Safety study found that while seniors are 11% of LA's population, they account for 26% of pedestrian fatalities. In 2019, LADOT secured $1.75 million from the state to create a Safe Routes for Seniors program, which we'll be launching this year. We are always adding new safety tools and approaches to our toolkit. Our new treatments in 2020 include speed tables, which are designed to slow speeds to 25 miles per hour on arterial streets were installed and hawk signals which protect people walking in crosswalks with a red light, legally requiring drivers to stop. We continue to explore cost-effective measures like modular pedestrian refuge islands and left turn calming kits, which also have the benefit of being easier to install and modify. Finally this year, LEDOT will analyze more recent crash data on pattern, uh, crash data and identify any new trends. We will also evaluate the efficacy of Vision Zero safety and treatments already installed. Your LADOT Vision Zero team is passionate and dedicated. We look forward to continuing to partner with the mayor, city council, partner departments, and communities to eliminate traffic fatalities in Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you, uh, and uh, thank you, and you know, as Nader said, thank you to the Vision Zero team. Thank you to uh, all the frontline workers, all the engineers, everybody who's, who's made all of these substantial improvements possible. Uh, that's, a, that's a phenomenal amount of work. Uh, I, I imagine there are a few people as, as frustrated and disappointed by the lack of, of, of progress and payoff from all those investments as the Vision Zero team and the DOT staff. Uh, uh, let, let me just get a better sense of the uh, of, of where we are. When, when this was launched, we were supposed to have a 20% reduction this year, by this year, of traffic fatality. Uh, we've not had a 20%, what is the, the figure? 7%. 7%? And there, uh, while there are fewer deaths overall, it's not safer for pedestrians, am I correct? That's correct. It's, it, despite all that work, it's actually uh, more hazardous for pedestrians. Uh, this is Dan Mitchell from LADOT. So I'll just add that in the after the um, executive directive and the program was launched, we spent the first year or so studying this wide city and understanding what kind of challenges we had and developing an approach to prioritize streets. Over that time, this, this problem got significantly worse. 
We started implementing improvements in January of 2017, and since we started making changes on the street, we have seen a modest 7% reduction in the people dying on our streets. That's a beginning. It's promising. The numbers so far this year are even more compelling, but I, we, we hope that holds. Um, and we believe that we now have laid the groundwork um, to see continued improvements. But it could be growing in other areas. We can only get to so much of the city. Um, we are prioritizing based on a data-driven approach and trying to make a difference. But it really takes everyone's daily focus and effort to make sure that our streets are safer. Uh, is it safer or less safe than 2017 for pedestrians currently? It is, it is safer today than when we started in January of 2017. Okay. Absolutely. Especially in the places where we have added left turn arrows, added new traffic signals, added flashing beacons at crosswalks. Over a thousand crosswalks brightened up to highlight people crossing the street. So absolutely it is safer in those places, but there's more to the city. And mm -hmm. so we continue to work systematically and passionately to try to change the culture on our streets. Uh, if, if you don't know the answer to this, it's okay, because I didn't forecast I was going to ask it. Um, do you happen to know uh, how our investment in Vision Zero in Los Angeles compares to, say, New York's investment in Vision Zero? Uh, not, uh, not right off the bat. I know that they started a couple of years ahead of time. I know that there's been significant investment there. Um, but, but per capita, I can't say how much more it is than, than we've invested in Los Angeles. It's, I would, we're not even close, right? I mean, that was a leading question. I was expecting okay. you were going to say, <laughs> they're, they're spending a billion dollars and we're spending 37 cents. It's sort of, you know, what, what, what's going on. Uh, and it's been tough just to get the Vision Zero funds that, that, that we've gotten in the budget every year. Um, part of the, 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 the problem I've learned is it's very hard to do the, the, the more significant improvements as a solution to a problem that most people in Los Angeles are not convinced exists or do not take that seriously. Uh, and I think that is really the case. Uh, uh, when we started doing some Vision Zero stuff in my district, people just didn't understand why we were trying to do something because they didn't really get that there's a problem. If you're a pedestrian, you get there's a problem. Um, uh, you know, if you're a senior trying to cross the street, you get that there's a problem. Uh, if you live in certain neighborhoods and underserved populations, you get that there's a problem. But, but, but overall, the typical driver in Los Angeles doesn't get that we have just an abysmal record on, on safety on our streets. Um, how is the department or the city uh, or advocacy stepping up in defining the, the, the problem to the public? Well, I think one, one um, project that we've brought to this council um, is the Rainbow Halo Project, which is our partnership with the um, growing but new uh, chapter of Families for Safe Streets, uh, an organization made up of people who have lost loved ones in traffic crashes or who have they themselves been the victims of a severe injury crash. And um, we, through our partnership with them, are helping to grow awareness of their organization, um, of their, and just grow the organization in general um, with additional membership. Um, the uh, New York DOT will uh, confirm that they are a significant advocacy partner in the city of New York um, and have done uh, tremendous work to change both state law and move local projects forward. Mm -hmm. Hi, Connie Yanos, LEDOT. Um, I think uh, Lauren referenced as well in her, in her um, preamble here that community engagement is something that we're not only prioritizing but really looking to expand. Uh, so we've had some real success in some of the, um, the grassroots types of organizing that we're doing around Vision Zero, really helping to inform residents 
about what these benefits are, and that has a ripple effect, um, and we intend to continue that and make that um, an even stronger focus in this year and years to come. So um, as far, and then I think a key component to that is education. So when we go out and we engage with residents, it's not just about this one particular project in your community, but it is a more robust education on why street safety matters and why all of the suite of Vision Zero programs matter to communities. And this is Dan Mitchell. I'll just add that I think we need to keep telling stories and personalizing the reality of the, the 244 people that died last year on our streets. When it's, when it's just a number and we think of the city streets as, as moving millions of people, it, it, doesn't bring the, it doesn't bring to light how many lives this has affected. But when one of your very own traffic officers is killed crossing a student, um, when one of your share, off-duty sheriff's deputies is killed after stopping to help someone get up out of the street, people really start to understand how pervasive this problem is and how it really requires everyone's help to turn this around. Uh, and one of the problems is we have a state law that keeps raising speeds. Laura Friedman's made a little bit of progress on that, and hopefully we'll, we'll see more. That's got to be a priority for us in, 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 in Sacramento. Um, I've got a few more, but Mr. Kretz? Yeah, well, I'd agree with you on what you just said about Laura Friedman, except I don't think she made any progress. I think she made some good efforts, and, but they weren't really able to, to move. There seems to be a lot of organized opposition to solving this problem. Um, I'm not 100% sure that our approach is working. So one thing I'd, I'd love to have the information on is how are we doing in terms of before and after at the intersections that we've done the work in? And how are we doing before and after in the rest of the city where we haven't? Um, my general feeling is that we might be doing better if we spent our money trying to market better driver and pedestrian behavior. And some of it, I see in some spots that are, are hotbeds for it, uh, uh, near the Orlando Hotel at Orlando and Third Street, um, I find that uh, almost every time I drive south on, on Orlando through that intersection, I see somebody rock, walking against the red light, not looking, even using their cell phone, with me coming 35 miles an hour towards them. And that's just bad behavior. And it tends to be, I think some of it tends to be younger people that are more used to using their cell phones when they shouldn't be crossing an intersection on a red light. Um, but people are doing it and they're not thinking twice about it. And I don't know whether we've been able to figure out how much bad pedestrian bad behavior, how much driver bad behavior, reading their emails, reading their texts, doing their texting as they approach a similar intersection. If somebody's not paying attention crossing on the red and the driver's not paying attention, there may be nothing that you could do to improve the intersection but marketing, staking it out and ticketing, doing some of the things that, that aren't physical improvements might actually make as much of an impact or more if we were really getting the word out that these are dangerous things to do and we're enforcing and writing tickets. Um, I don't know if we are enforcing and writing tickets in those circumstances. I don't suspect that we are. So have we looked at those as as options, uh, trying to do the marketing rather than trying to do all the physical changes to hundreds of intersections that could help one by one. Well, I will kick off by saying that um, in 2018, we did spend $2 million on a citywide campaign that really focused in on a speed reduction uh, throughout the city. I think there's been some cross-collaboration with LAPD as well um, to get um, more information out to drivers um, about how to be aware of their surroundings. 
uh, and we are monitoring closely any sort of data, but the reality is, is that there's a lot of analysis around distracted driving, but there isn't that type of data uh, to really support distracted pedestrian behavior. And I'll just add that we need to do both things, and we've been doing both things. So it's, it's not one or the other, uh, because uh, relies, I mean, this, this program relies on physical improvements as well to make the places that where we've seen problems safer. Uh, part of our strategy for this year is to do an in-depth evaluation uh, because, um, because it takes time to measure significant changes in those behaviors uh, for them to show up in the crash records. Um, that's something that's taken a while, but we're actually taking another approach, uh, which is to look at near misses. And so um, we have engaged uh, a company who is analyzing video at intersections to help understand the near misses that are happening, and that may reveal some of the benefits of the improvements that we're doing. So we're doing both. We're evaluating both um, the, the improvements that we've made, we're understanding the near misses using new technology. We are um, making physical improvements in the street to make our streets safer, and also doing outreach and marketing to help um, change the culture in our city. Yeah, if, if we could do more on that end, I would be inclined to think that would, would have a big payoff. And also in enforcement, I actually was the principal co-author of Joe Submidian's bill to, uh, to ban uh, texting while driving and some of those other bad activities. Um, and I noticed right when that was implemented, people were complaining about getting tickets for it. And since then, it's been years, and I don't anecdotally hear uh, a lot of complaints uh, among my friends, people I interact with. I just don't think those tickets are being actively given anymore. Uh, so that might be something we could combine uh, a little bit of a campaign, some free media, and some actual enforcement. Um, but I don't think we've ever really gone after the pedestrians that are doing the same thing. And it is as dangerous or more so to walk against a red light in a major intersection and be looking at your phone and not looking to see if cars are racing towards you. And so... If I could encourage uh, some of those, those uh, Vision Zero dollars to go more in the direction of marketing and encouraging uh, enforcement uh, as, as one of those steps. Thank you. Um, it, I'll just add, as far as the speed limit goes, that um, our general manager, Salita Reynolds, and I have both been participating on the task force in Sacramento that has... Um, resulted in a new report that was released, um, I believe, last week, uh, and included in provisions, one, one really important provision that I'll highlight uh, about speed limits in Los Angeles, that it would allow the city to retain speed limits that had previously been approved unless a change was made to the street specifically with the purpose of increasing the operating speed. So that would get us, if, if, and if that was picked up and, and enacted by the legislature, that would allow us, that would get us out of this situation where we had to raise speed limits in order to enforce them. We could actually retain the speed limits that we had and break that cycle of creeping up speed limits. Any chance we could important. include the ones that we already had to increase when we had no need and go back to those? Yeah, so the, the recommendation from uh, from... CalSTEM and the state was actually to in include that in, or in order right. to roll back to speed limits that had been approved under the uh, previously. I think that's all very good news. Any, any sign that it would be better received now that there's a report out that points out the problem? Well, I, I believe that... Um, that Freeman is picking that up and starting that discussion again, introduced a bill yesterday. AB 2121. That, that would um, allow discussion, would permit discussion on that and start to bring in these recommendations. Uh, so hopefully that we get there. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, on the, uh, 
Uh, the last item, Mr. Koretz noted how he agreed with everything I just said, and I was hoping to be able to extend the same courtesy on the subject, but... Um, Probably not exactly. Not, like not, not on this one, no. <laughs> uh, on so much, yes, but on, on, on this one, and, and I hear the comment about pedestrians a lot from LAPD as well, and, 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 and from a lot of folks, uh, and um, that, that argument always while I understand where it comes from, it rubs me the wrong way. It just, it, it feels like blaming a, a, a mugging victim for, for walking in the wrong neighborhood. I mean, uh, there, there are times when maybe the pedestrian has a, a, has a role in, in, in the collision, but as I said to some folks from LAPD last week, I just think that there is a, a higher responsibility for safety for the person who's operating a two-ton metal machine at, 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 at high velocities. It's, it's, I just think there's a, a different moral liability to it. And um, uh, I, I would, my, my guess is that, my, my sense of human behavior is that, um, No matter how much we try to persuade people not to text, and I, I do think we do need to do more on that, I agree, but how, however much we, we do that, the, the, the pull of a, of a public education campaign is never going to be as strong as the psychological pull of a wide open street is to a motorist to speed. It's just, it's, it's demonstrated time and time again, a wide street, you go faster. It just, it feels like it's the right speed to go faster. I do it, I mean, everybody else does it. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's sort of been demonstrated again. Um, I'm, I'm curious, because there, there's various elements of this, right? There's, there's the, the education, there's the enforcement, there's the engineering, and I'll get to the equity part in a moment, but um, have we seen in cities where Vision Zero has been more successful than us? Uh, have any of them been able to give us any feedback or uh, quantification on, of those three E's, where they got the most bang for their buck? I don't know that we have that information, but we can certainly bring it back. Okay, I'd be, I'd be curious about that. Yeah. Um, um, uh, also, New York has been very, very successful. Uh, uh, I, I, I imagine New Yorkers are, well, they're, New Yorkers I imagine are as bad at uh, uh, pedestrians texting and jaywalking as, as we are. I mean, I'm from the East Coast. I think East Coasters jaywalk significantly more than, than, than Angelinos. Uh, I was shocked when I got here and realized most people don't jaywalk. It's just in, in Boston, you don't stop, you just go. And, um, and I was shocked in the opposite direction <laughs> when I used to visit my relatives in Boston. But now we, we have sort of met in the middle We've met almost. in the middle, huh? Um, the, uh, I imagine they still have have pedestrians who are texting. I imagine they still have jaywalking, but they've managed to, to do a lot of significant reduction. So I'd be curious to hear from New York more about, has it been education or has it been engineering? I'll just, I'll just relay what, what I know for what I've learned from them and I've seen, and it's been, the, the difference has been the transformational changes on the streets and how the streets operate in the, the design priority um, for the most vulnerable people. And instead of prioritizing how easy it is to get around by car, they've been prioritizing the use of each and every one of their streets in a data-driven way, in the same approach we've been taking. Um, but it's where they've made those more transformational changes that they've seen the direct results. Uh, and by transformational changes, you don't always mean a, a reduction in lanes. It's often the pedestrian refuge islands or, or, or bell belts, restrictions on turns, stuff like that. 
Yes, it's changing the character of the street. That's mm -hmm. the important part. To change the character of the street as a place to drive through quickly, uh, to a place to to be and um, and exist safely. Yeah. Sometimes the infrastructure is a lot more effective than the the um, than than words in the art of changing um, behavior. Um, uh, one of the, the things that, that I think has been difficult about Vision Zero here in Los Angeles is, one, we haven't done enough of the ambitious stuff. We haven't funded enough of it. And um, we just don't have a big enough Vision Zero budget. But also, we, I don't think as a body, talk about it with enough regularity. It's become almost an annual thing now instead of a regular thing. I know you guys talk about it all the time, but um, I, I think I'd like to see quarterly reports on Vision Zero just so we keep the, the, the conversation going and that we're not just looking at this a, a year from now. Um, I mean, it, it can focus on the work being done on the priority corridors, but, but, but just a snapshot of where we are uh, that year I, I, I think will be, will be helpful. We'd be happy to do that because, as you mentioned, we're working on it every day. Yeah. Uh, I, I personally review, and I know, I know Salida sees them as well, each and every person who's killed on our streets uh, while traveling, and it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. Uh, uh, before I forget, with that in mind, and we're almost at the end, um, I'd like to adjourn this meeting in memory of Orson Bean. Mm. Um, my constituent who was uh, killed in a collision uh, in front of his wife, in front of his theater the other night. Um, do you have any other comments, questions? No, I'd just like to say that was equally shocking to me and someone that goes through all the things you go through through 90 plus years and then to get run over by a car, it just, it just seems uh, terribly ironic. Uh, okay, so we'll approve the report. Uh, ask. Uh, there's another speaker's card? Just one. We had already done it earlier. Too close. Uh, public comment, not right. Yeah, we already closed the public comment. Uh, okay, um, you're not getting a Christmas present next year. Uh, <laughs> uh, Wayne, you get 60 seconds. Yes, Vision Zero is a big fucking failure, isn't it? You just have to go on Temple and Los Angeles Street and look at how Mr. Koretz caused a man's leg to be run over yesterday in front of the Roy Ball Federal Building. It's all Mr. Koretz's fault. He is responsible for that broken leg because he knows Vision Zero is a fucking mess, and that's why he wants to go to information campaign instead of road diet campaign. So take all those bike lanes and all that obstruction, remove it from my road so that I can go like Mike Bonin does and take my eight ball and run down with my truck at 75 miles an hour and get to the 101. Let's drive faster and let's do it on drugs. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Uh, with that, um, we will approve this item with the quarterly report back requested. Uh, and uh, we will adjourn this, memory, this meeting in memory of Orson B. Thank you.